Okay, good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday uh, Facebook Live uh, today with uh, two very special guests. Uh, I know a lot of you have been anticipating this, uh, this show for quite some time, so really excited to, uh, to bring it to you. Uh, today a little bit earlier than, uh, than usual, so thanks for tuning in uh, early. My name is Christian Ogenfus, and I'm with the Napa Valley Wine Academy. And today, uh, I'm very pleased to, first of all, introduce our uh, hostess, uh, our host for uh, today's interview, uh, and that is Lisa uh, Stravopoulos. And she is um, an industry veteran, uh, almost 20 years in, in the wine business, uh, is a, a WSET uh, graduate of levels one, two, and three, so super knowledgeable, um, and has been working uh, for the last nine years with, with Greek wines, so something that I know a lot of you have expressed interest in knowing more about, so we're really happy to have you uh, here uh, today, Lisa. Lisa is also um, currently the owner of Greek Wine Tours, uh, which takes students on trips to, to Greece. In fact, we were uh, going to be in Greece with uh, Lisa this, this year, but unfortunately due to the uh, COVID uh, situation, we were unable to do so, but we're looking very much forward to uh, joining that trip uh, next uh, next year. So without uh, further ado, let me bring Lisa on screen. And Lisa, um, why don't I let you introduce our very special uh, guest today? Sure. Hello, good morning. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity. Very excited to be here and talk about Greek wine, because I know it doesn't get much coverage uh, in the WSET program, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I brought in my um, friend and colleague, um, Kostantinos Lazarakis, who is going to join us and give a lot of um, interesting background, history, and information on the category and kind of what's next. And so Kostantinos uh, is a, the first master of wine in Greece. He also runs the kind of equivalent of the Napa Valley Wine Academy in Athens. So in 2006, I believe, Constantinos, or 2005, you started the, um, the Wine and Spirits Professional Center? We, we started in 2004. I got the MW in 2002, and it got me two years to set up the whole thing. Great. And then he's also published uh, two editions of Wines of Greece. I would actually show you the book if I could find it, but I'm doing a remodel, so everything's packed in boxes. So that's not going to happen. Um, he's also a highly sought-after uh, consultant for many... Uh, wine producers, restaurants, hotels, and uh, a wine judge as well. Um, he also is the member of the board of directors for the Institute of Masters of Wine. So um, talk about somebody who's very, very educated in the, the Greek wine world. So excited to, to have you here. So what we're going to do today in our relatively short period of time, because if we want to talk all about Greek wine, we'd talk for days. But um, so we're going to kind of uh, shrink everything into a nice little 45 minute capsule or 30 minute capsule and um, and hopefully you'll walk away with a lot of knowledge that you didn't have before. That's the goal anyway. So to kick things off though, we're going to start with uh, some Greek wine history, but in the modern era, because if we talked about 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years of, um, of history, we'd be here until Monday. And so we're going to kind of focus it to the last century. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll go to the uh, regional overview, um, along with some facts and figures about, about the category, and then walk through some of the regions, talk about their, diverse, um, their diversity and also their similarities. When I got into Greek wine, well, I've also been to Greece many times, of course, given my family, but I was amazed at how diverse the climate is. Most people think of Greece as sun, fun, islands, and it's like that all year round, but it is um, it is not. And uh, that was my big wow when you uh, really start to understand the category. And so we'll talk about those things, or those are uh, those that, and then we'll talk about of course the varieties. Uh, um, indigenous varietals are so amazing and so daunting to some people, uh, and there's so many exciting things happening. And then we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about what's ahead, um, either new varietals or clones. And uh, so that should really give you a good idea um, on the category itself. So uh, first of all, Casatinos, thank you for joining us. It's a bank holiday weekend. So we're at, right now for him, it's sa Saturday night at nine o'clock uh, p.m. And all his family is in the other room eating. And, uh, he's eating. So, okay, I, I have to, I have to uh, thank you. 
to uh, Lisa, Chris, and the Napa Valley Wine Academy for your interest in Greek wine. And it's really fascinating to be here with, here with you and um, just uh, discuss some Greek wine. Yes. So let's, um, so Chris, can you put it the first slide I have there? Awesome. And so obviously Costantinos you know, will do a much better job than, than I would right now. So when you're tuning in to see him. So Costantinos, can you walk us through a little bit about kind of this modern a modern um, Greek wine history. Obviously, everything after the Ottoman Empire, wine was discouraged for you know, 400 years, uh, no plantings. If they wanted to, it was heavily taxed. And then for Greece, you know, in the next century, obstacle after obstacle, whether it was wars, phylloxera, um, uh, financial crises, and now COVID. So can you walk us through a little bit about what's happened in Greek wine in the last uh, in the last century. Okay, so, um, well, I'll, I'll just briefly go even before that. I mean, in the golden age of Greek uh, philosophy and Greek theater and Greek, uh, everything Greek, uh, Greek wine was also one of the most important products. Well, in ancient Greece, we had the first uh, legislation, we had the first grand cruise of the wine world. So what we did to mess things up? Well, uh, it was downhill from there on. So we became, shortly after the Golden Age, um, uh, we became a neglected part of the Roman Empire. Then we had Byzantium, which was not as good as many people expect. Then the Ottoman Empire. Then we had to fight for our independence. How this thing forms up Greek wine as we speak? I have the theory of the two aristocracies. You must have one aristocracy producing fine wine and one aristocracy being able to appreciate fine wine. In Greece, in Greek modern history, we were almost bereft of both aristocracies until very recently, if that. So we were not having enough time to focus on quality and then have that quality appreciated. And then in about the 1980s, we had a big boom. We had the um, the, the uh, sort of the, the revolution of the small producers. Before that, it was only bulk wine. It was only producers bottling millions of bottles and nothing after that. In the late 1980s, we had uh, some people that had been studying abroad or had been working at the bean wineries, starting boutique quality oriented wineries. And then the whole thing was booming. We have now about a thousand wineries in Greece, a lot of them producing really top quality wine. So all we need is the image. I do believe that Greek wine should be far better um, engulfed by the Venus status quo around the world because it's, it's a great wine. Absolutely agree. Could you spend a little bit of time talking about um, the uh, in the 60s and 70s, even before the 80s, when quality really started to take off, there was the everybody made their own wine, domestic consumption only, nothing was exported. And talk a little bit about Retsina, because what's Retsina, um, if you talk, especially in the States, anybody who tries to sell Greek wine, uh, there's a lot of people with the memory of Retsina. And, um, and that's been that's been another obstacle that uh, has been difficult to overcome, but what's interesting is that generation is moving out and the younger generation doesn't know uh, the history and the relative importance of, um, of Retsina. Would you mind spending a few minutes talking about Retsina? Yes, of course. Um, um, before the 1980s, uh, I mean, for millennia, wine was a very important part of our lives, but it was a staple product, but it wasn't an aspirational product people wouldn't think about paying a top price for a wine, but they would always be on the table having food and have wine. If you're having food without any wine, then the only acceptable thing to do is having breakfast, okay? Everything else is, is a symbiotic relationship. Now, um, on those days, we had a huge part of the Greek population making their own wine. Then we were having um, uh, producers being big, focusing mainly on the bulk production 
or selling millions of bottles. And also, in the last century, we had Retsina. What is Retsina? It's adding a bit of pine resin into the wine during fermentation to flavor it. Um, Retsina, for some people, was the longest nail in the coffin of Greek wine um, because uh, a lot of bad, bad Retsina was produced and it was giving Greek wine in general bad name. That was correct, but that doesn't mean that Retsina is uh, a bad wine. Nowadays, we have some amazing Retsinas made from great wine flavored with some top quality resin because you know you can have bad resin you can have really fine resin if you like vermouth if you like okay uh, let's face it if you like wine aged in oak barrels then you are drinking flavored wines you are drinking a wine flavored with the resins etc of wood so retina is not so bizarre uh, that m many people think, and I think it should be reinvented, should be revisited, and should be reappreciated by a huge part of really knowledgeable and thoughtful wine drinkers out there. Yeah, I brought um, a group. I don't know. This was a couple couple years ago. Ago, and there was a a very young spirited. 75 year old man that was on the trip and we went to Papi Nakos and had his modern day Retsina and he was like no 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 bring back the um you know the the, the Retsina I had on the barrel in the 60s and so uh, yeah but, uh, uh, I relate I relate yeah yeah I bet okay great well let's um let's talk about some facts and figures and start diving into the map if you can Chris move to the next page and here Constantinos, I was wondering if you can just talk through just some some key uh, figures in terms of you know what, how big is the is the region or how big is the country and how the regions are broken out and maybe touch on the PDO PGI aspect so people have an understanding. We won't spend too much time here because I think it's important mm -hmm. to get through rivals, but I think so. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that, okay, uh, regarding PDOs and PGIs, this is exactly in line with all the other European countries. So if you know your legislation, your can legislation in France or uh, in uh, Spain, then it's pretty much what we're having in, uh, in Greece as well. Uh, I think the key fact to take away out of this slide, because it's uh, Saturday morning and I don't want to kill people with numbers, is that, um, uh, for example, some people... Um, drink water and they think they're having an exclusive product in their hands, even if it's a, a 10 euro, 10, $10 uh, uh, basic Bordeaux in their hands. And they think about Greek wine and they say, mm, yeah, Greek wine is uh, a bit uh, more mainstream or a bit more dull, blah, blah, blah. Well, just Bordeaux, um, we're talking about one region in, of France, produces more than double the wine of the entire Greek Greek annual production. And if you uh, exclude, uh, and if you uh, think that we drink more than 80% of the wine we're producing, um, if you just uh, leave your place and you go into a local shop, if you're happy enough to have some Greek wine on the shelves, buying a bottle of Greek wine outside of Greece is an exceedingly rare, it's a very exotic uh, event. Greek wine is rare. It's made from artisanal producers. Okay, look at the facts on the vineyards and the acreage. The annual, I'm sorry, the average acreage of a vineyard in France, the average is only exceeded by 10 vineyards in Greece. Uh, I don't know if you get it. Only 10 vineyards in Greece are higher, are larger than the average vineyard holding of France. So we are talking about fragmented production, artists and producers, it's really human scale, and that's rare, and that's an advantage nowadays. And um, we'll talk about price points later, and, and it's amazing how affordable Greek wines are. Given oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe, maybe say a few words about that. Okay, I think that there are um, hundreds of labels in uh, Greece that if they were made exactly in the same style, exactly at the same, at that quality, and they were coming from Tuscany or from Napa Valley, you would have at least an extra zero on their price tags. You know, the disadvantages of Greek wine production now turn into advantages. 
You can have uh, wines from Santorini being $30. These are really heartbreaking wines to sell at that price because, you know, um, if you get into the financials, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a, a action folie. Um, so I think people should be buying Greek wine because it's great value as well. In a way, in a world going bonkers on many wine regions, Greek wine is the same voice. Excellent. I agree. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide and start getting into some specifics about the regions. This might 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 be too small to see, but you kind of get the gist of it here. Um, so what I so Constantino, can you walk us through maybe, I mean, you know, in five minutes, you know, from north to south. Uh, what I love about again, I mentioned before about Greece is that the diversity. Um, in climates and as such, the soils is so vast in such a small country. 80% of Greece is mountainous, and most people don't realize that. Uh, and that creates a, you know, a plethora of opportunities for wine growing and wine production. You know, from the north up in um, um, Macedonia down to Santorini, the differences are vast. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the the regions, the diversity and climate. And then also, I think I have, you know, we have some slides on, I'd like to focus on the Peloponnese, Nausa, and Santorini, because again, these are the three, right now anyway, the three areas that are um, really part of the, the WSET curriculum, um, and also mm -hmm. part of the tour that we were going to bring people on. So if you could do that for us, that would be great. Okay, yeah, um, I'm not sure um, uh, a lot of people can read the map, and I'm not sure if, uh, again, they want to be bored by no, names. No, no, I mean, up in the but north. But just generally, I mean, you know, the yeah. north. Okay, uh, I'll expand on a couple of things that you said. Okay, so um, as you can see, Greece is a, a country surrounded by sea, and it's the tip of the, essentially, the Balkan Peninsula, the Balkans and to Greece. So we're having two major seas. We have on the right between uh, Turkey and ourselves, we have Aegean Sea. And then on the left, we have Ionian Sea, which is uh, um, a part of the Adriatic Sea uh, system. Um, you can see also a lot, a lot of islands. And it's exactly what you said, that 80% of Greece is mountainous. So we are having all across Greece a fantastic system that is full of places of high altitude being extremely near to places that are coastlines. You have endless coastlines. You have a lot of valleys. You have a lot of islands. So Greece is a mosaic of extremely particular mesoclimates or climates that as a whole is extremely difficult to duplicate in a place like Austria or in a place like um, Spain. Also, because of uh, the, the fact you have an extreme um, uh, fragmentation of grape varieties. I mean, we have been producing wine for thousands of years. So Vitis vinifera had the chance to develop into very distinct and numerous great varieties. I don't know if you know the story that, you know, you have a small island in the middle of nowhere and you have suddenly the lions being there, uh, being very mini-sized or the elephants being huge. Um, you have these things happening in zoology. It's exactly in venology. You are, when you're having isolated systems that have limited interaction with places that might be very near yet so far, you have different styles being developed, different grape varieties, you have different climates. So you have a lot of things like that in Greece. Also, people think Crete, the, that big uh, island at the bottom of the map, and they say, oh, it's great to go on holidays. Uh, so, you know, great climate for swimming, not great for wine, because now we live into the infatuation of cool climate. No, cool climate is related to the great variety you're working as i'm always saying is that um what is northern rome is warm climate or cool climate well um it's something that it depends on the great variety it's too warm for wrestling it's too cold for mouvet or grenache 
So if you walk around the Greek vineyards, you'll spot that all the grape varieties, the preferred varieties, are grape varieties that behave in specific vineyards like they're grown in cool climate, meaning that you have to work hard to get the grapes properly ripe. This means that Greeks understood for centuries that in order to make interesting wine, you have to cultivate grape varieties to the edge. You have to keep these wines, these vines, working hard to achieve maturity, but when they do, you get interesting wines. So, the combination of climate and grape varieties gives some excellent wines with the refreshing acidity, moderate amount of alcohol, which is very important in today's wine world, and great flavors and food friendliness. We have been selecting grape varieties um, that are food friendly. Um, forgive me for saying that, but if Gewürztraminer was a grape variety that was uh, that popped up in the middle of a Greek vineyard, I suspect that it would be extinguished like uh, off the face of Greece within years because we work with wine in the daily manner in in a way that working with Gewürztraminer would be very difficult. I don't know if that makes any sense or I was just on a rant. No, 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 no. That totally makes sense. Um, maybe what we'll do is we'll talk about the varietals and I want to highlight some unique growing, um, uh, you know, the unique growing distances between like Nausa and Santorini in the Peloponnese. So maybe um, we can focus on those right now. And I'll, actually, if you, yeah, if you go to the next slide, Chris, I'm going to have you go back and forth a little bit now. So um, these are so the the industry oh gosh, 10 years ago, um, decided, oh my gosh, there's over 300 indigenous varietals in Greece, and there's maybe 60 that are planted, maybe 40 that are commercially available. But we can't overwhelm um, the, 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 wine, the wine public, if you will. Uh, and so there was an effort to focus on four key varietals to begin with, two reds, two reds and two whites. Uh, there's more now that are becoming more commercially um, popular. But this in the in the beginning, these were the four, um, the core four, if you will. Mosophilero, Certico, Iritico, Zignomagro. And they all at that, you know, had their unique growing growing areas. Um, so maybe what you can do, and I have the next three slides to talk about the growing area, but maybe Cosentinos, you could talk about um Moscofilero, the Moscofilero and Ayritico grape. So the um Moscofilero is white, Ayritico is red. And we can talk a little about those two varietals and the Peloponnese uh, in general. Okay, what I'm saying about um, the, the complexities of Greece as a vine growing area cannot be exhibited more clearly when discussing Moscofilero, Moscofilero and Aioritico, Aioritico. Moscofilero is actually a pink skin grape variety, but it's used mainly in producing white wines, either still or sparkling. Uh, Ayurgitico is a red, is a black gray variety, and you can have excellent rosés, although the powerhouse lies with um, uh, the reds. Both of these gray varieties are grown at the heart of Peloponnese. Maybe it would be a good idea to go to the um, uh, map slide, and Lisa, if you can use your pointer to um, uh, to say, uh, to, to point exactly where um, um, Peloponnese is. Okay. So, it's so the, um, it's the um, big, sorry, Chris is navigating. Chris, it's the big um, purple area outside of Athens that says Nemea. Yeah, that's Peloponnese. Okay, so um, if you look on the uh, sort of, um, um, it looks like a hand, okay, and there is a thumb. Um, so the, upside, then, upside yeah, down. Outside Athens, yes. So um, a bit further up, a bit further up. Okay, in Nemea. here where you are, Chris, uh, yes, it's Nemea. And then towards the heart of Peloponnese, you have Mantinia. Nemea is the appellation for Ayurgitico, while Mantinia is the appellation for Moscofilero. You can drive from Nemea to Mantinia in less than 30 minutes. And you are in Nemea and you can have a quite warm weather 
and the producers having a Yurgitikon can produce anything from bright, refreshing rosés to really big, tannic, age-worthy um, Yurgitikos. And then you drive 30 minutes and you have Moscofilero in Mantinia. Mantinia is a plateau, 600 meters, really cool weather, where you can even have some sparkling wines that are just amazing. Okay, um, some words about the stars of the grapes. Um, uh, Ayurgitico smells beautiful, smells like beauty, sweet fruit, sweet spices, loves oak, consumes actually oak, and on the palate is extremely velvety, uh, but still has quite a grip, while Moscow Filero is quite flavorful. It reminds some people to muscat, but, but with a bit more limey grip. And on the palate, it's high acid, it can be really dry, and you have to struggle to get a Moscofilero of 12% alcohol. So in a world that is getting completely bored of 15.5% um, uh, alcohol wines, Moscofilero struggles to achieve 125 And if you can, Chris, can you go one slide over? Uh, or maybe two slides, like, going to see. Um, uh, no, that's now so I have a misfigured. The next one, please. Thank you. Oops, sorry, go back. <laughs> go back one and then another one. Yeah. So there's an average uh, um, Peloponnese vineyard. And you see it has, you know, if the, um, there is high elevation there. There's what, maybe the highest vineyard is, you know, 3,000 feet uh, and there's a lot of influences from the mountains and then it's also right by the sea so it's a very um it's a very beautiful and diverse um wine growing region so that's the wine growing region of Ariitico and Moscofilero so let's talk a little bit about um if you can go back one slide Uh, okay, that's okay. So let's talk about, um, okay, so those were the Moscofilero and Ayurjitico. Uh, let's talk about um, Nausa and Zignomavro. Nausa okay. is far, mm -hmm. a far north, very cool climate. Um, take it from there. Okay, so um, uh, Xinomavro is the king of uh, the northern part, which is Macedonia. And uh, we are having quite a few PDOs. Um, yep, we're having quite a few of videos um, that are using Xinomavro. It's Xinomavro. And um, uh, Nausa is very moody, is very rainy, is uh, not the best place to visit, especially when you are having uh, a relaxed bank holiday or whatever. Um, <laughs> Xinomavro, in some ways, it's the Nebbiolo of Greece. It's not related uh, in any way to Nebbiolo, uh, but the style of wine produced by Xinomavro is really close to that. It's um, uh, very pale in color, turning to brown very fast. It's um, miles away from the fruit bomb we're quite used to these days. Uh, it's um, very uh, vegetal. It's like uh, tomato leaves, sun-dried tomatoes, and quite wild pungent spices. And then you get it on the palate, and it's quite acidic and quite tannic as well. So why drink it, people would ask. Well, you have to drink it because it's one of the most complex wines you will ever see. It's very age-worthy. Bottles from the late 60s can be absolutely sublime as we speak. And still, you can get these Xenomabras now for $20. I mean, um, I have been given by um, a couple of um, master sommeliers blind, a Barolo and, a Bar and I'm sorry, a Barolo and a Nausa, and uh, they asked me to identify um, the wines blind. I knew it was one Nausa and one Barolo. I wasn't aware which is which. After tasting these wines for 10 minutes, waiting like a pig, I said, okay, this is the Barolo because this is the best wine. And that was the Nausa. The problem was that Nausa was something like four times cheaper than the Barolo. And that, of course, was Barolo's problem, not the Nausa's problem. Right, exactly. And um, Signomavro means acid black because of everything. Acid black, yeah. 
the yeah. right the, the right on the acid bit they're lying a bit on the black yeah a little bit more brown yeah um okay cool so let's go to santorini so we're we went from the north now we're going way down to the south um to santorini santorini as many of you know um uh, amazing place to grow a certain so uh, the birthplace of a certico a certico is found elsewhere um now uh throughout greece but still, its its home is is the volcanic island of Santorini. Um, if you can go to Chris, I think it's the second to last page. I think it's page. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, Constantinos, let's, let's talk about Santorini, um, the region, and then Assyrtiko, the bridal. Okay, so these are some of the most bizarre vines you will ever see in your life. They are basket trained because Santorini is very windy, is very, um, uh, is very dry, is very sunny. So the only way that you can protect the vines uh, from the wind and also try to preserve um, the little mist that is coming out from the volcano's caldera every morning is by having these wind and mist traps, the baskets. Um, these beasts that you're looking at are most probably more than a couple of a hundred years old, and the root systems are going to be far more, uh, far older. Why is that? Santorini is uh, having no phylloxera. Actually, it's not phylloxera free, it's phylloxera immune. You cannot get phylloxera in Santorini because phylloxera needs at least 5% clay to crawl, and Sandorini, being a very young volcanic soil, has zero clay, okay? So this is quite bizarre. So you have these vines being trained like that. When the basket gets too bulky, then they get a cane from the base, they chop the basket off, they just put it as a decoration on the wall um, above their fireplaces, and they start a new vine. So you might see now vines that might be some like 40, 50 years old above ground, but the root systems can be three, four centuries old. And I'm not talking nonsense here. We found vines of that age. And then um, you're having a climate that is completely incompatible with what we call top quality wine, and you're getting a wine like that. Why? Because it's the grape variety, it's a Sirtico. A Sirtico is not an aromatic grape. It's a very hardy vine. It's, um, uh, it can go quite high in alcohol. It's more textured rather than uh, expressive. But then you have masses of acidity. Uh, for the uh, people that enjoy numbers or technical details, most of Santorini's are below 3 pH, below 3, in order to get other wines uh, of that pH level, of that high acidity, you have to go to Mosel Rieslings, okay? So you're having Mosel Riesling, some of the coldest climates in the world uh, with a specific grape variety like Riesling, and these wines have to struggle to match the acidity of the acidico vines, of the acidico wines that can be up to even 14, 14.5% alcohol. So it's a bizarre thing, it's a bizarre place, it's a bizarre wine. But Assyrtiko is on its march to conquer the world. We're not talking about only Greece. Now we have Peter Barry doing amazing work with Assyrtiko in Clare Valley. Then we are in Australia and we are having people in Italy, in California. Um, uh, um, Elisa, I think, brought me um, an Assyrtiko uh, wine at some stage when we met there. Uh, from California, it's it's a it's an absolutely sublime gray variety. Yes, I agree. And then, can you explain? I mean, some people may know, but some others. The um, uniqueness of the soil there. Obviously, it's a lot of pumice. It's a lot of um, you know, it's a volcanic island. Can you explain for those maybe who don't know why it's so unique? And you know, back to the vol um, volcano eruption of. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, at, um, at 16th century BC, we had a huge eruption of uh, the Santorini um, uh, volcano. 
Um, I mean, if you see a map of Santorini, it looks like a croissant. It used to be a round island, but then uh, the, the core part erupted, went up in the air. Uh, people say that the Minoan civilization was destroyed because of that eruption. So all the people in uh, Santorini left. Uh, actually, bizarrely enough, we were not able to find a single body uh, that uh, that um, someone deceased uh, uh, during this eruption. So people had uh, quite a lot of fair warning and left. So Santorini, apart from some very few places, is covered from the soil, from the uh, volcanic matter that was uh, erupted and then settled on what remained in Santorini. So we are having, a, as I said, a very young soil. We are having... Um, uh, extremely low organic content. Um, in, in Santorini, when they're having some like 15 hectoliters per hectare as a yield, then they are happy. They are opening champagne because they cannot afford open another bottle of Aseptico. Uh, this is crazy. You, you talk about uh, Chateau Ikem, and uh, they say, oh, we're doing Chateau Ikem at uh, 15 hectoliters per hectare. No, they're not. Their vines are producing a lot more, maybe three times more, what they select from the vines, berry by berry, comes down to the complete number, to the final number. This is not what is happening in uh, Santorini. The vines working in full speed ahead, and the only thing they're producing is 15, sometimes 10, sometimes 7 hectoliters per hectare. And okay, let's face it, you're not talking about something happening like this in the middle of nowhere. You have one of the most amazing islands in the world, beautiful touristic destination for millions, and some people are struggling to produce, to craft top quality wines under all these circumstances. You, you must support Santorini, you must drink more Santorini wine. Santorini wine producers really need your love. Absolutely. I'll drink more. That's fine by me. Good. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, yeah, amazing, amazing wine. Um, well, I want to make sure we have time for questions here. So the last, if you can go to the last slide, um, uh, um, Chris. Uh, so now we're kind of talking about the future. You have an idea on the three main varietals uh, or the four main varietals. We've talked through uh, the regions. We've talked about the history. So what's next? So in Nemea, not far from, um, you know, in, in the region that we were talking about, Bacasiatis Nursery uh, started, I think, in the 30s, uh, and his son has taken over, and Bacasiatis has been, his mission is to find, or to find undiscovered, and to find rediscovered, and to find new varietals, clones, throughout Greece. They, he actually, you know, will go out and seek, talk to farmers and say, do you see anything that's unique here in terms of um, a leaf or a vine or whatnot? And he has a very impressive nursery where, again, um, the group was going to be last week, but we're going to go next year. And so right now in his nursery, he has 180 rediscovered varietals that have gone extinct or nearly extinct. And, and the goal is to kind of bring all these back and to see what's commercially viable. I mean, some things aren't going to work anymore. Um, he had discovered three that are that some wineries are are experimenting with that are look promising. Um, and they're here. Um, Zach, Nick, you're going to you're going to pronounce it better than than I am, Cosentinos. But um, Zacchino, Macrimodia is the white and Marostifo. So, yes, do, if you it's have any just if you have any words you can talk about with um, Bacchus uh initiative and, and these varietals, that would be great. Okay, so it's Zakinthino, it's Macripodia and Mavrostifo. And um, okay, if, um, if um, Greece is the Jurassic Park of Vitis vinifera, then definitely uh, uh, Bacchus is Sam Neil. Actually, if you look closely, you'll see that looks like Sam Neil as well. Um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, oh, he, 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 yes, he's, uh, he's spending around days and nights of his life uh, visiting the most remote places in Greece and comes back home with bizarre grape varieties that we don't know a thing 
most of them we know are going to be not very important, not very interesting. But then I bet that after 20 years, we are going to revisit Greece and we will see a lot of grape varieties at that time being famous, producing great wine that today no one or possibly just Bacassiet has heard of. So Greece, Greek wine is a work in progress is great now and it's going to be even greater in the coming years. So it's exciting and it's developing every single day. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think we should hear from the um, viewers if there are, Chris, are, are there any questions? We have, you know, whatever we have, 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes to see if there's any questions for either of us. Yeah, so um, the one question uh, that came in a little bit earlier was about the, uh, the soils of Santorini, but I think you addressed that and, and phylloxera. Uh, one, one, of, one part of that question had to do with minerality. Does the volcanic soil impact the minerality of, um, uh, of the wine? Oh, okay, but we can talk about that for the next uh, couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that um, Vitis vinifera can, um, can absorb through vine rootlets elements that finally will have a direct impact on the final taste of a wine. I believe that uh, what we call minerality, because wines are mineral, especially in Santorini, it's something like uh, along the lines of uh, wines being fruity or by, uh, wines being spicy. We try to, um, to uh, sort of reflect to our memory bank by coming up with the, the M word. Uh, but uh, yes, at the same time, you're having a grape variety that is not uh, aromatic, is not very estery, um, it's uh, high in acidity, it's very textural, it has a lot of dry extract. So to some degree, you can, um, you can, uh, Rosalind, uh, you can um, uh, think that it implies minerality. And of course, um, the gray variety and the terroir push the wines towards this, but uh, I'm not thinking that the minerals found in the vineyard of Santorini is the main reason behind this, uh, this um, uh, taste. Yes, but I think this is something we have to work on. Uh, if Austrians manage to uh, have people doing Grüne Veltliners, then we can do the same with Xenoma Vroena Jurgitico. Uh, it's just a matter of working hard. I mean, let's face it, Greek, I'm um, sorry, the world of wine in general is getting too boring and we have to respect the diversity. We don't have to mute it. I also think... Um I think the wine drinking public now has gone past the, oh, I need to be able to pronounce Merlot, Cabernet, Pinot Noir. And they're looking for things that are, you know, more interesting, more, maybe more difficult to pronounce. But, you know, so they can say if they're at a party or they bring a bottle of wine. It's like, oh, this is an Ariitico from Nemea. It's, and it's, it's like, a, uh, you know, something to be proud of and something to be, you know, be able to teach somebody else. Uh, and so I also think the timing is right, um, you know, for the Greek wine bridles. I know ages ago people were thinking, because Ayurvedico is translated to St. George. Let's put St. George on the label so people understand that, which is, you know, not the right thing to do. And so, and I think, I think the wine drinking public would agree that, you know, I don't, you know, that's too English. I, you know, I want to find something that's interesting and, and, you know, sexy, if you will. So, you know, I think it's, um, I think we're at the right time for, for bridal pronunciation like that. I think the biggest exporters, although I might be wrong, uh, is uh, Butaris, Kiriani, Thimiopoulos, and Caridas. Um, yeah, Diamond uh, Wine Importers brings in yep. Kiriani. Okay, Please yes. Let's get this on the screen. Um, also, uh, we have Ktima Alpha producing Sinomavro, but this is uh, Aminteo. Uh, 
oh yeah, you have the full gamut, Lisa. Um, and, and I don't really believe that vintages do matter. I mean, they matter in terms of style, but not in terms of quality. In Greece, we rarely have really bad vintages and the top people know how to craft excellent wines on every single vintage. And also 2019, from what I'm hearing, you know, so you can chime in too, excellent vintage, one of the best in the last 20 years. So, um, but to your point, I don't, the vintage variation is not so much, but you know, 19 was, um, was a killer year. So wait a couple of years before that comes out. Yep. Well, uh, I, I spent up, up about three hours a day for the last uh, three months talking exactly about that, and I don't really know. I think that Greek wine is very heavily on trade reliant, and that is uh, specific to both exports and the national market. Um, so uh, if the on-trade is affected, then definitely the Greek wine is going to be affected, which is a, a big shame, to be, to be honest. Um, Constantinos, how much... I mean, it's, a, it's hard to, you know... But a lot of wines are not exported from Greece. A lot of wines stay in Greece. An average producer may be... You know, an average major producer exports half of their 30 to 40 percent, 50 percent of their production abroad and the rest is kept internal, correct? Or domestically, I should say. It, it, it really depends. It varies widely. And so I would imagine, I mean, obviously everybody is, nobody's on trade right now or on premise, you know, um, um, you know, for, for wine drinking. But do you see that, do you see on, that that off-premise sales will increase or that, you know, will there be, you know, there's a demand for wine. The demand hasn't gone away. You know, is there, you know, is, is it just going to shift, you know, channels or will it catch up or is it going to be like in Greece? I know a lot of people shift to, um, you know, the bulk wine or the Hema wine. Um, um, okay. Um, in, in Greece, some of that demand will shift to the off-trade channels, off-premise. But then I do believe that uh, the, uh, in export markets, especially in the U.S., um, uh, is um, all about the on-trade. Uh, I think that uh, uh, more than 90% of the Greek wine is consumed in restaurants. You go, uh, you don't feel great about Greek wine, you don't know things, and then you go to, um, uh, to a sommelier and proposes a xenomavro, and you say, yeah, I'll have that, you have it, and you, you are crazy, and then you drink just that. Uh, but then how many of these people will actually go to um, a retail shop and ask for a bottle of Greek wine and find a decent bottle of Greek wine? I don't really know. Yeah, so yeah. Um, in export markets, Greek wine will be affected as long as the on-premise uh, sales are affected. Absolutely. Chris, any other questions? Right. Um, uh, you could have a couple of uh, hours uh, answer to that. Okay. In Greece, we never have just one food. When we sit at the table, we have a lot of small different plates with highly contrasting tastes. So Greek vineyards have been unnaturally evolving together with humans in order to select the grape varieties that can match widely different flavors. So this is the great taste of Greek wine. This is the great aspect of food and wine matching when we are relating to Greek wine and anything that relates to the world of food everywhere around the world. And Greek wine, the acidity is so great um, or so perfect for food matching that really you can open any bottle uh, with anything. And believe me, I've done it. And, uh, and it'll taste great. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Uh, 
Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you for everything. I will. Okay. All right. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.